Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Greg, I should let you on to a little secret about 2024. <clears throat> Some years ago, I wrote a book that I felt would not be wise to release right now because I speak in parts of the world where if it were released, I, my life might be threatened a bit. That gives you enough of a clue. So I wrote about it and I made a contract with the publisher that it would be released posthumously. So they took the contract, took the manuscript, did everything. And all of a sudden, one day I saw in one of their magazines the title of my book. And it said to be released in 2023. <clears throat> So, it's a true story. I didn't make it up. So hurriedly, I contacted my representative, my agent, and asked him if he knew something that I didn't know because I'd like to get my house back in order. So if indeed that was some prognostication 2024, it wouldn't be good anyway by 2023. Uh, I might be looking down from another part of this world, and uh, you'll be having a better speaker. Uh, somebody wrote to me, Last week, uh, you know, one of the things I really appreciate is all the advice I get. My mother-in-law is the chief of them. Uh, <clears throat> and every time she gives me some advice, I say to her, you know, Mom, I'm amazed I travel around the world and manage without all the wisdom you give along the way. And we have a marvelous relationship, I say it tongue in cheek. But uh, one gentleman wrote to me and he said, I used to live in Salt Lake and so on and so forth. He said, you know, the folks out there really love funny stories. So he said, make sure you, I don't know whether you thought my face wasn't funny enough or what it was, but uh, so let me abide by his advice because the message is gonna be heavy. So I'll give you a little lighthearted story here which will segue into what I really wanna say to you. You may have heard me tell this before, but it's always at least one person who hasn't. So here it is. As a bagpiper, I play many gigs. Recently, I was asked by a funeral director to play at the graveside service for a homeless man. He had no family or friends, so the service was to be at a pauper cemetery in the Kentucky backcountry. As I was not familiar with the backwoods, I got lost. I finally arrived an hour late and saw the funeral guy had evidently gone, and the hearse was nowhere in sight. There were only the diggers and the crew left, and they were eating lunch. I felt bad and apologized to the men for being late. I went to the side of the grave and looked down at the vault lid was already in place. I don't know what else to do, so I started to play. The workers put down their lunches and began to gather round. I played out my heart and soul for this man with no family and friends. I played like I'd never played before for this homeless man. And as I played Amazing Grace, the workers began to weep. They wept, I wept, we all wept together. When I finished, I packed up my bagpipes and started for my car. Though my head hung low, my heart was full. As I opened the door to my car, I heard one of the workers say to another, never seen nothing like that before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. You know, there's uh, nothing like being at the wrong place with the wrong instrument and the wrong mood and the wrong message and hearing the right comment at the end of it all. And it's wonderful to know that, no, we're not dreaming, we are here at the Mormon Tabernacle and uh, we are guests of the leadership here in Elder Holland. I want to thank you, sir. Pat, thank you so much. And please also thank Elder Perry for me and all of the leadership. Elder Perry came and visited me in Atlanta as we had a nice lunch together. I should tell you a funny line about him. He was 89 two years ago and he was bounding up the steps ahead of me. I've got two titanium rods in my back. I have to be careful with every measured step, two back surgeries. I said, boy, you have a lot of energy. He said, let me tell you something. He said, 89, that's not old. He said, now 91, that can be old. So two years later, I meet him now, and he's upped it. Uh, he told me, no, 91 is not old. He has to go for a few more years, and we agree. He does a marvelous job, but on a serious note, I am honored, truly honored, and privileged to stand behind this pulpit and have the opportunity of speaking, talk about the immense trust the leadership has in giving me this honor, so I do not take it lightly. 
And I want to thank all of the pastors for coming together and uh, just standing together. Greg, you're a dear friend. You're a courageous man, and uh, you go through a lot of strides and uh, efforts, and it's made it possible for us to come together. We've had a wonderful time, had a great open forum at uh, Brigham Young yesterday, and saw a wonderful art display of Arnold Freeberg, his Ten Commandments display, and other artwork is here. If you haven't seen it, you really should. You know, sometimes a picture is better than a thousand words. Sometimes a word is better than a thousand pictures. Like the great poet who talked about the conversion of water into wine at Cana of Galilee and said, the conscious water saw its master and blushed. <laughs> a word can say a lot. A picture can say a lot. If you haven't seen that display, I urge you to go there. It's very moving to see some incredible scenes that he's captured. And most of all, you know, truthfully, I travel over 200 days a year. Last year was 240. In fact, next week, this time, I will be in Thailand and then on to Indonesia. So we, my home is in Atlanta. So for me to have my wife with me is a rare privilege. I don't know how many times I've had her on the platform with me. As we were leaving the hotel, she said, I'm really grateful to the Lord. They didn't ask me to sit on the platform. So I don't know what I'm going to hear when we go back tonight. Uh, but uh, she'd rather be out there. She said, I get more out of it uh, from up uh, watching from the audience rather than from the platform, but having Margie is a great joy. And Fernando, thank you for coming from Albuquerque and take our regards back to your family. I want to talk to you about a difficult theme. And as tough and as tortuous it might be winding our way through the subject matter, I hope meaningfully we can come to some applications. You know, it is G.K. Chesterton who said, Nothing ultimately constructive comes out of mere art, nor does it come out of mere logic or reason. There has to be a good moral soil from which great art and great reason sprouts and flourishes. And so what brings us together? As has already been said, yes, we have our deep theological differences. But I think it's commendable that we find a common cause in trying to create a good moral soil in this culture and in this time. You don't have moral soil, you will not have great art, you will not have great reason. All you will find is systemic contradiction. And the dangerous reality is that we are almost getting comfortable in that kind of contradiction, where meaning, reason, and purpose doesn't mean anything anymore. It's sheer, brute pragmatism, doing whatever works for the moment. And the truth of the matter is, when you only do whatever works, in the end, it really doesn't work. Because life has to have that ontic referent of the eternal from which the temporal must find its relevance. Eternity is like the anvil. Time is like the hammer. It beats away at the anvil of eternity. And ultimately, the hammer will be thrown away. And the anvil will remain. So we must build our lives upon things that are eternal. Lessons from history. Building a nation under God or talking about the sacred and the profane. I speak to you from two passages, 2 Kings chapter 21 and 2 Kings chapter 22. I just take a handful of verses. We are talking about the late, late 600s before Christ. Manasseh has been born into a home where a huge revival had been ushered in by his father, Hezekiah. And yet, in a move of power and a move of self-aggrandizement, in an attempt to glorify his own name and forget the legacy of his dad and all that its history had represented, he made some choices. Here's what the scripture says. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. His mother's name was Hephzibah. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord following the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. 
He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had destroyed. He also erected altars to Baal and made an Asherah pole, as Ahab king of Israel had done. He bowed down, bowed down to all the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his own son in the fire, practiced sorcery and divination, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Fifty-five years he reigned, the longest reigning monarch in their history. Brought havoc, real havoc. And then after he died, his son reigned for a short year or two, Amon. And then came this little boy by the name of Josiah, chapter 22. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 31 years. His mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adaiah. She was from Bozkath. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right nor to the left. Every time I go to the Middle East and walk some desert terrain, I think of the words of Percy Bysshe Shelley, who wrote this. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them, half sunk on the sand, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that the sculptor well those passions read the hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. Who sneer and wrinkled lip and sneer of and touch of cold command tell that the sculptor well those passions read, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. Now looking across the desert terrain, he said, nothing beside remains round that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. You can go today and see the names of demagogues, once upon a time writ large, bullying their nation bullying their people, dominating the lives of the masses, now relegated to a piece of stone fallen somewhere in some desert. The dem demagogues came and went. Some, some still try to come, not recognizing that someday they will go. James Russell Lowell, the famed American writer, said this, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth with falsehood for the good or evil side. With each choice, God speaking to us offers them the bloom of light, then the man or nation chooses for the darkness or the light. It is the same man, James Russell Lowell, who wrote, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, and the scaffold sways the future, but behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch, keeping watch, above his own. Truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, but the scaffold sways the future, and behind the dim unknown standeth God within the shadows, keeping watch, keeping watch above his own. History leaves a trail. History leaves its mark. In one way, someone has rightly said, although reductionistic possibly, when he said, it is a collection of innumerable biographies. That's what history is. But those biographies leave a mark, either for good or ill. My, famous, my favorite romantic poet um, wrote these words in a piece of poetry that he, uh, Samuel Taylor Coleridge said this, if men could only learn from history what lessons it might teach us, but passion and party blind our eyes, and the light which experience gives is only a lantern on the stern which shines on the waves behind us. The light which experience gives is a lantern on the stern which shines only on the waves behind us. Look back. Look back upon the last 10 years, last 20 years, last 40 years. What's gone wrong? 
with us in the West. People abroad can see it. They know we've lost our moorings. We have not even connected the fact that our fact that our economic woes really have also been built on a pragmatic philosophy with no accountability. We live without recognizing it has to be paid back. We live as if there are no resources. And the way we keep moving, living beyond our moral means and our fiscal means and our spiritual means, we think there will never be a payday someday. Always comes back. Reality has a strong reach. And once to every man and nation comes this moment to decide. I take you back these 2,700 years ago to the life of Manasseh. And what is it he did? He made three decisive choices. The first thing he did was repudiate the faith of his fathers who were anchored in the revelation that God had given through the Torah and then the prophets who had come over those 1,400 years you know, and built a nation out of them. That he, he repudiated it, turned his back upon the Word of God. And once he turned his back upon that Word of God, he took that next step. He silenced the voice of truth. It is a logical outworking. When you want to introduce a lie, you have to silence the voices of truth. I bring to you the talk of a man who spoke, Arthur Schlesinger, who spoke several years ago uh, at uh, the induction of the Brown University president in 1989. This intellect, here's what he said, and I kept a portion of his speech. Listen to what he said, speaking to university students. The mystic prophets of the absolute cannot save us. You didn't notice that? Prophets of the absolute cannot save us. And then he goes on to say this, sustained by our history and traditions, we must save ourselves at whatever risk of heresy or blasphemy. We can find solace in the memorable representation of the human struggle against the absolute in the finest scene in the greatest of American novels. I refer, of course, to the scene when Huckleberry Finn decides that the, quote, plain hand of providence requires him to tell Miss Watson where her runaway slave Jim is to be found. Huck writes his letter of betrayal to Miss Watson and feels, quote, all washed and clean of sin for the first time I'd ever felt so in my life, and I knowed I could pray now, end of quote. He sits there for a while thinking, quote, how good it was all this happened so, and how near I come to being lost and going to hell, end of quote. Then Huck begins to think about Jim and the rush of the great river and the talking and the singing and the laughing and the friendship, quote again. Then I happened to look around and I seized that paper and I took it up and I held it in my hand. I was a trembling because I'd got to decide forever betwixt two things and I knowed it. I studied a minute, sort of holding my breath, and then I said to myself, all right then, I'll go to hell and tore it up, up tore it up. Schlesinger adds this line, that if I may say so, is what America is all about. All right then, I'll go to hell and tear it up. That, if I may say so, is what America is all about. Now, if this had come from an unthinking man, you could accept it. But a great intellectual like him, who doesn't seem to know that the loss of absolute had taken place prior to the scene that he addresses. It was the loss of the absolute that brought about that very setting where people had been exploited and abused and enslaved. It was because of the loss of the absolute that all of that contradiction had come in. Does a man like Schlesinger have to be told that? Ah, but it sounds good, doesn't it? Cavalier, that we'll tear up any idea of an absolute and take whatever consequences there may be, and an average young student just gobbles this up and laps this up. When Moses came down from the, Ten Command with the, from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, what was it that God had given to him? 
very simple in one word sacred trust life is sacred your life is sacred my life is sacred your marriage is sacred your property is sacredly protected your word must be sacred your worship is sacred your time is sacred now we tear it up and the desacralization takes place till we've come to a point when nothing is sacred anymore. We talk so much about one's rights, we talk so little about what is actually right. It's an alarming trend, and so often the intellectuals have led the way in this. And so Manasseh comes, he leads the people in a rebellion against the revealed word of God and the moral law was lost. The moral law was lost. As soon as the moral law was lost, the prophets began to be silenced. In fact, the prophet who told us of the way the Messiah was going to come, the prophet who gave us the titles of the Messiah, wonderful counselor, everlasting God, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, they were given to us by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah had to flee from the wrath of a man like Manasseh. He hid inside the hollow trunk of a tree and was sawed asunder. And the book of Hebrews refers to them, some of them who were sawed asunder. Isaiah was that man killed under Manasseh. He did not want to hear what the truth was. You and I can easily live like that. Silence the truth. Be buried under a lie. Just I don't want to listen to what the absolutes are anymore. The word reminds us that it was given to us that it would be hidden in our hearts that we would not sin against him. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The scriptures cannot be broken. Your word abides forever. This is the sacred word of God. So precious is it, is it that I want to say this to you. Who in the New Testament experienced one of the greatest ex uh, moments that any human eye could have enjoyed. That experience was vouchsafed to only three of them, Peter, James, and John. And they go up into this mountain, and all of a sudden their eyes cannot contain this blinding white light as the body of Jesus is transfigured in that brilliance, and as Moses and Elijah descend, and the three of them fall on their faces. So profound is this, so powerful is this, that Peter actually stands up and makes the comment and he says, you know, uh, I think we ought to stay here. I really don't want to go down anymore. Can we just build three tents? Can we just build three tabernacles and make this our dwelling place? And Jesus says, no, we've got to go down. There's work to be done. Bear it in mind, Peter, saw this. Peter experienced this. You would think he'd experienced the ultimate. Here's what he says. And now we have the word of the prophets made most certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter, who experienced the glimpse of the transfigured Christ, says this is the word of the Lord made more certain. The propositional truth to him transcended any momentary experience, and he pointed to the greatest reality that God's word is truth. Manasseh blocked it out. So number one, he starts off as he looks at the terrain and reacts against his father's reformation. Number two, he decided to silence the voice of the prophets. And then number three, it led to the logical outworking of all of that. It was the fact that this took place. He, he, it uh, accelerated the development of heathenism. Chesterton put it this way, the tragedy of disbelieving in God 
is not that a person ends up believing in nothing. Alas, it is much worse. A person may end up believing in anything. There's only one angle at which you can stand straight and many, many different angles at which you can fall. And so that word was a reminder of how truth must stand firm and stand straight, but he turned away and accelerated the development of heathenism. Do you want to know what he ended up doing? He instituted child sacrifice as he had the altars with the brazen arms of a flame below them and brought his own son and offered him as a sacrifice. Child sacrifice took place. One historian writes this, the hideous image of Moloch, the god of the Ammonites, once more rose in the valley of Hinnom, and Manasseh himself led the way in consecrating his own children, not to Jehovah, but to the grisly idol, or as the phrase ran, making him pass through the fire to the god, as of the flames burning away the impure earthly body, let the freed soul pass through them, cleansed from all taint of earth, to unite with the Godhead. Nighttime seems to have been the special time for these awful immolations. The yells of the children bound to the altars or rolling into the fire from the brazen arms of the idol. The shouts and hymns of the frantic crowds and the wild tumult of drums and shrill instruments by which the cries of the victims were sought to be drowned rode in an awful discordance over the city, <clears throat> forming with the whole scene visible from the walls by the glow of the furnaces and flames such an ideal of transcendent horror that the name of the valley became then and still stands to this very day in the form of Gehenna the usual word for hell. Do you get the picture? The children brought, tossed into the flames, drums pounding so that their screams would not be heard. It formed such an ideal of transcendent horror that going back 2,600 years ago, it was given the name, the Valley of Hinnom, Gehenna, the place of hell. You can walk through the valley of Hinnom today in Jerusalem and know that at Manasseh's time, this name was given. I bring three conclusions from his reign. Number one, it is possible for one person to lead millions into untold evil. Think about it. It's possible for one person to lead millions into untold evil. You know, when I saw this vividly with my own eyes, I saw it twice actually, once visiting Auschwitz, where 12,000 were obliterated every day, where Hitler had the words outside the gas ovens, I want to raise a generation of young people devoid of a conscience, imperious, relentless, and cruel, where I saw thousands of pounds of women's hair stashed behind glass. I remember walking away from that. This is in the 80s when the Cold War was still going on and thinking to myself, my word, how did one man accomplish this? But not long after that, I happened to be given the privilege of speaking at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow, where all of their presidents have been trained and taught how to think on moral theory and ideology. My wife was with me. I sat alone at the head of a table with her on one side and a colleague on the other. And all of the atheistic professors around in this grim looking room, with their grim faces hostile in their questions for somewhere between two to three hours, as they hurled their questions at me, and I tried to make a defense of the Christian faith. You know, Joseph Stalin was once upon a time a seminary student. He gave up his faith in God, and with that clenched fist, decided to build a nation <clears throat> under an atheistic belief and killed 15 million of his own people. <clears throat> Malcolm Muggeridge personally told me that Svetlana Stalin personally told him that the last thing her father Joseph Stalin did before he breathed his last, he was lying in bed hallucinating and the one last physical gesture of Joseph Stalin was he clenched his fist towards the heavens one more time, threw his head back on the pillow, and he was gone. I told them some of these stories. 
their faces started to soften. Their expressions became more accepting. They lined up at the end of it, took my wife's hand, kissed the back of her hand, waited and shook hands with me. And the chairman of that institute said these words to me, and I quote, he said, Mr. Zacharias, I want to thank you for coming here. And what you have told us today, I believe, is the truth. But it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. It's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. Imagine the power of a single life to build that lie in a nation. And now with mass media, we have even more of that capacity for people to swallow a lie. But the second reason is this. It's because most people don't know how to think anymore. Believe me. I've heard some of the most astounding comments in institutes of high learning. Since this is being live streamed, I'll be a little kind about the location. <clears throat> but I remember at one university, my colleagues were there, and one guy stands up, goes to the microphone, and he says, how do I know that I exist? I suppose he's paying his fees. I suppose he knew he walked in. How do I know that I exist? What do you say? Without taking too much of time. And possibly a pinprick. <clears throat> but I didn't do that. <clears throat> I just looked at him and I said, may I tell you what Professor Nathan said to one of his students who stood up and said, how do I know that I exist? He lowered his glass and looked at him and said, and who, shall I say, is asking? <clears throat> <clears throat> At another university, this girl goes up to the microphone, cups her hand, you know, they don't even wait for the ground rules sometimes. No, we're not masochists, but we do this kind of work. So she goes up, cups her hands and says, you've talked today about culture seeking coherence? Who in the world told you culture needed to be coherent? Where did you get this from? Is this not another Western idea being foisted upon us? I didn't look Western. I don't think I acted Western. But anyway, that was her question. Is this a Western idea that's foisted upon us that uh, we, culture needed to be coherent? So I, yeah, I let her talk. I've learned. If you allow anybody to talk long enough, they actually end up convicting themselves. So I just uh, let her talk for a little while. So I finally said, ma'am, I'll be very happy to answer your question if you will just answer mine, and then I'll proceed with my response to you. When I'm answering you, do you want my answer to be coherent, or may I be incoherent in responding to you? <laughs> and the whole audience just burst out in applause, and I said, no, 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 no. Please don't laugh. I want you to answer my question. Do you want me to be coherent, or may I be incoherent? She walked away. You see, we hold counter-perspectives to the test of reason, but very seldom do we test our own, whether we are being rational and reasonable. So G.K. Chesterton, describing where society was headed, said this, it's going to be worth it, you're coming, just to listen to this quote from Chesterton. Here's what he says. It's a mouthful, folks, but you've got to listen carefully. He said, the new rebel is a skeptic and will not entirely trust anything. He has no loyalty, therefore he can never be a true revolutionist. And the fact that he doubts everything gets in his way when he wants to denounce anything. For all denunciation implies a moral doctrine of some kind. And the modern revolutionist doubts not only the institution he denounces, but the doctrine by which he denounces it. So he writes one book complaining that imperial oppression insults the purity of women, then he writes another book, a novel, in which he insults it himself. He curses the Sultan because Christian girls lose their virginity, then curses Mrs. Grundy because they keep it. As a politician, he cries out that war is a waste of life, then as a philosopher, that life itself is a waste of time. A Russian pessimist will denounce a policeman for killing a peasant, then prove by the highest philosophical principles that the peasant ought to have killed himself. A man denounces marriage as a lie, then denounces aristocratic profligates for treating it as a lie. The man of this school goes first to a political meeting where he complains that savages are treated as if they were beasts. Then he takes his hat and umbrella, goes on to a scientific meeting where he proves that they practically are beasts. In short, the modern 
evolutionist, being an infinite skeptic, is always engaged in undermining his own minds. In his book on politics, he attacks men for trampling on morality. In his book on ethics, he attacks morality for trampling on men. Therefore, the modern man in revolt has become practically useless for all purposes of revolt. By rebelling against everything, he's lost his right to rebel against anything. That's what you call systemic contradiction. One can lead millions into untold evil. The reason they're able to do it is because most people cannot think for themselves anymore. The lost art of rational thinking. And the entertainment world has played a huge part in this, in bypassing reason and coming through the back door of the imagination they have wreaked havoc in our time till supposedly art seems to think even the profane is passé because it is art. The Bible tells us even art has its absolutes to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That which is profane cannot possibly beautiful. And the last ramification of Manasseh is what he did with his own children. Need I even apply it in our time? You know, when I was starting out in ministry years ago, I was in a little town in Australia. My wife was with me at that meeting. She'll remember it well. Just a handful of people in the audience, about 40, 45 max, maybe. I was just starting out. And, but there's a woman sitting on my right, very agitated through the whole time, very disturbing. I just looked in the other way and continued speaking. And at the end of my talk, she came up to the front and left her children with somebody. And she said, can I talk to you? She looked rather disheveled and unkempt. And I went into the pastor's office and shut the door. She said, Mr. Zacharias, I can't even believe I'm talking to you. She said, I'm a horrible woman. I'm a horrible woman. She said, I hate things religious. I am never wanted to come into a church. But my friend who's here tonight has kept bothering me to come and come and come. So I grabbed my kids, put them into the car, and I'm here. And as I was driving here, my son said, Mom, can I? And I turned around and slapped him across the face and drew blood. She said, I'm sitting in the middle of your talk, and I look at his feet, and he's wearing his sister's shoes. And I said, what are you doing? He said, Mom, that's what I've been trying to tell you all the way in the car. And here, in getting me dressed, you put my sister's shoes on me. These are not my shoes. And the mother is just sobbing and she said, what am I doing to my kids? What am I doing to my kids? And the guy is there with the blood having come out of his mouth and the friend taking care of him. I've become a grandfather in the last couple of years and now we have three beautiful little grandchildren. And I'll never forget one moment when our little grandson Jude was brought into the room and put in the arms of his mother, our daughter, Naomi. She's there with truly this little baby leaning on her breast, and she is so ecstatic. And then the nurse comes and is talking to her with a pad, and the nurse says, now, Naomi, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put a bracelet on your wrist and we'll put a bracelet on the baby's wrist so that if anybody takes this baby away from this floor, an alarm will sound in your room and in the nursing station. And my daughter's expression told it all. Holding a precious little child, that you mean it can happen where somebody will come onto this floor and try to steal someone else's baby? I ask you, take a look at society today and ask yourself, what are we doing to our children? We may end up making Manasseh look tame because there were a handful sacrificed. 
we are eliminating them by the millions. I shudder to think of what has happened to our reasoning. Where is it gone? I know it's a sensitive topic, but I have to say it. What's happened? Why has this happened? Where are the voices going to be to stop the carnage? It's a tragic thing. But after Manasseh saw all the havoc he'd wreaked, the years went by, and you know what? He repented. But the damage had been done. His son comes on for a short period of time, then comes Josiah. When Josiah comes on, ladies and gentlemen, he's only eight years old. Only eight. At 16, he begins to seek after God. Don't underestimate the power and the value of youth. One of the things we do in our ministry is focus a lot on youth. Some of our young people have very tender hearts and very eager minds. Just today, I've got a long letter from a 17-year-old young woman. She's probably tuning in, listening in. Brilliant letter on exposition and a discussion of the life of Oscar Wilde in her letter. I had one letter from a 12-year-old a year or two ago talking about the fact that he'd read all of my books from Can Man Live Without God, which had been a series of all lectures at uh, Harvard to all the others, and the way he narrated them, and I was so overcome by this guy that a few weeks ago I went to visit him in the Middle East to find out if this guy was for real. He was and is. Young people, if you're a young man or woman here, don't underestimate your value in commitment to Christ. Take the mind that God has given you and give it to him as an expression of your worship. He will make you an instrument of his truth and for his glory. At the age of 24, he starts to cleanse the temple here. And here's what happens. At the age of 20, actually. You know what happened? The high priest comes up to his secretary and says, does anyone of you know anything about this book? And they even refer to it as, one of them says, we found a book. You would have think he'd said, we found the book. We found a book. And they take it to Josiah. Josiah is the king. And he looks at it and he reads it. Do you know what's the first thing he does? He rends his clothes, falls prostrate before God, and deals with his own sin. And then he calls the high priest, calls the rest of them, and he says to them, bring together a gathering. We are going to have a national repentance, and I'm going to read the book of the law to the people, and we are going to get this right before Almighty God. Do you read the scriptures? Do you take the Bible, open it up, and see that it is really a book? that reads you and so thoroughly discloses your heart. You know, I marvel at the fact that at the age of 17, when I'd never cracked open a Bible on my own, the previous year, a little bit of exposure had come. Prior to that, never opened a Bible. I'm not even sure we had one in the home. I think my dad had one. But I'm lying in a hospital bed. Do you know why? Because I wanted out of life. My life had no meaning. I wanted to be a cricketer. I wanted to play tennis. I did it well, but I would never have excelled to the ranks of the best. So I wasn't even going to make it there. I just did it, played at a university level. That was it. And as I'm lying in this hospital bed, having attempted to take my own life, a man walks in with a little red Gideon's New Testament. I couldn't reach out for it because my body was dehydrated. The moisture was gone. It was a servant in the house who rushed me to the hospital. And my mother takes that Bible that he gives and she says, you really can't stay here. My son is in critical condition. And he said, ma'am, your son needs this more than anything else. And so he opens to John chapter 14. 
where Jesus is talking to Thomas. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except through me. And then he goes on in verse 19 and says, because I live, you also shall live. The power of the word of God to crack open this encrusted heart of a young man who'd never had the wisdom to open it before. And I begin to pray. And I say, Lord, if you are the Lord of life, take me out of this hospital room. I will leave no stone, un no stone unturned in my pursuit of truth. That day is so vivid in my mind. Every time I go to Delhi, my home city in India, I always take a taxi and I go and park outside that hospital room and I just saw the hospital building and I just sit there for about 10 or 15 minutes and recall what happened when I was 17 years old. It happened with the Word of God. It happened with the Word of God. And as I walked out of there, five days later, the doctor looked at me and he said, you know, young man, we've given you back your life, but we cannot make you want to live. I just said, doctor, you don't need to worry about that. I had that little red New Testament and I walked away from that room. The man who brought that New Testament into my room died last year. I spoke to him a few days before he died from our home in Atlanta. He was living in Los Angeles. I wanted to come over. He said, Rob, don't, 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 don't. He said, you've got many, many other things to do. But here's what he said to me. He said, I just want to say to you, I sit down sometimes and watch you on YouTube, and the tears run down my face, and I think to myself, the main reason God brought, God brought me into this world was to bring that Bible. I said, Fred, God brought you into the world for a lot more than just that. He said, no, man. He said, I just want you to know, I can't say enough of what it means that you're one of my sons in the faith, and it gives me the greatest amount of joy. Thy word is true. Thy word is true. If there is just one application you take away from tonight, can I urge you to open the scriptures and make it a commitment to read the Gospel of John? Just take the scriptures. Read the Gospel of John. Stay with the Word. Stay with the Word. Because that is what turned the heart of a nation back under young Josiah. That is what turned David's heart, and that's why he said what he did in his Psalms when he says, you know, your word is truth. It is a lamp and a light, and how the scriptures cannot be broken. Paul says to Timothy to bathe in those scriptures that he learned as a little boy. But not only did he give them back the scriptures, he gave them the privilege of worship in the Passover. I want to spend a few moments on this before I bring this to a close. Do you know what life's purpose is? Ever wondered about it? That you may have communion with the living God, your maker. You know, when a man and wife join together in that holy, consummate, physical expression, it is not at all accidental that the old English talked about the marital vow in these words, with my body, I thee worship. Wow. It is the sacred consummation of the physical that is merely an expression of the spiritual bond. What goes on is what actually happens in the knitting of two lives, two destinies, two purposes, two wills, two hearts, two commitments. And that physical consummation is simply that exclusivity that this is a relationship that is sacred to temples of the living God coming together as one. It's incredible what God has done in this. You've lost it today. It's gone with the wind.
trivialized, profanized. And what God is asking you and me is to worship. I look at it this way. He brings the Passover to them. Why? To remind them of their former enslavement and the liberty and freedom that he brought to them. So here's what I want to say to you. Don't ever forget this sequence. When God rescued his people, redemption is prior to righteousness. You cannot be righteous until you are first redeemed. Redemption righteousness. You cannot worship until you're redeemed and righteous. That is the chronology. That is the logic of it all. Redemption, righteousness, and worship. And so my Lord, before he goes to the cross, sits down with his disciples. This is the body that is broken for you. This is the cup of the new covenant, of my blood, which is shed for you. And I will not enjoy this again until we celebrate it in the presence of my Father. Holy communion with the living God. That is life's purpose. And once you enjoy that communion, you enjoy the purpose and life becomes interpreted in all of its goodness and all of the foibles and all of the pain that comes your way. Three results. Number one, what happened after he gave them this? Number one, it built within them the conviction of safety. Ladies and gentlemen, you are never more safe than we're in the hands of God. Time and time and time again, I've experienced this. You know, Billy Kim, the Korean evangelist, talks of the time during the Korean War, there was a man in the shell hole who was being ordered by his commander to go and uh, rescue his fallen mates as the firepower was raining so much out. But this guy kept ducking the orders, kept ducking the orders, and kept looking at his watch, wouldn't get out of his shell hole. Finally, after being reprimanded several times, he looked at his watch one more time, jumped out of the shell hole and went to rescue his fallen mates. The next day, one of them looked at his exhausted expression and said, what is going on with you? Three times you were ordered and you only did something by looking at your watch till finally you got with it. He said, I hate to tell you this. I'm not right with God. I was terrified of what might happen. But I remembered my mother told me what hour each day she was going to be praying for me. And I kept looking at that watch till that hour would strike. And I knew, covered by my mother's prayers, no matter what happened, I would be protected by my Lord and my mother's prayers carrying me through. I've spoken at so many of our military bases. I'll never forget the lineup at Qatar Doha, Doha Qatar, CENTCOM, where they were lined up after my talk late one night. And almost every one of them with a piece of paper and a telephone number. Call my family, tell them I love them. Call my mother, tell her I love her. And they all followed it with one more line. Please pray for me. All the firepower in the world doesn't give you the protection as the canopy that God can give you. It builds the conviction of safety. Secondly, it gives you the power to change. It gives you the power to change. Has your heart been redeemed by Christ? See, here's the point. We can talk all we want about society out there, but the book of the law was lost in the house of the Lord. If we who claim to follow Christ don't have the word of God, why point the finger outside? Your heart and my heart need to be transformed. The Bible calls it the new birth new hungers, the new life. And lastly, it rescues you from the tyranny of the immediate. Yes, we can get discouraged. We can. But you know what? We don't live just for the moment. History said Martin Luther's like a drunken man knocking himself from one wall to the other and getting himself senseless with every hit. 
we reel from one wall to the other. History will come with its changes, but let us be rescued from the tyranny of the immediate. What do I mean by this? Who 25 years ago would have ever guessed that the fastest growing church in the world would be in China? I have some friends listening on from there, so I won't say too much. But they brought one person into their home for me to talk to, a pretty prominent individual. I won't say any more than that. And at the end of that three hours of interaction, this person said to me, when I said, can we pray? You know what this person said? I'm in my 70s. I have never heard a person pray in my life. Tonight, when you prayed before we ate, was the first time I'd ever heard anybody pray. And what shocked me was that you prayed for the servants in the kitchen. And we prayed. The fastest growing church in the world is in China today. God can turn the tide in America. You pray, I'll pray, the day will come. A few years from now, we will look back and say, did you ever imagine something like this could happen? But it has to begin with your heart and mine. And so before you go tonight, or before you go to bed, Get on to your bedside and ask the Lord to make you right with him. That's where it begins. I close with two simple illustrations. One of the greatest books ever written is that written by John Bunyan called Pilgrim's Progress. If you have never read it, you have picked your own pockets. Read it. I think it is accurate to say outside of the Bible, it's been translated in more languages than any other uh, language in the world. When my wife and I visited his home in Bedford, England, there's a huge statue of John Bunyan in the center of the square, and somebody's painted footsteps going from there, hither and yon, and he still lives. Bunyan gives a beautiful climactic moment when Pilgrim arrives to the hill where his bag is going to fall off, the burden. You see, he was looking for the celestial city, but he got a shock. You never get out, get to the celestial city without going through Calvary. You never get to the celestial city without going to the cross. So the burden falls off, and here's what he says. I saw three shining ones, the angel of dawn, the angel of daybreak and the angel of dusk. This is allegory. The angel of dawn says, thy sins be forgiven thee. The angel of daybreak takes the new robe and the sandals and puts it on him. And the angel of dusk gives him a scroll and a mark on the forehead to move on towards the celestial city. The first, the spiritual. The second, the physical, the third is the scroll, the intellectual, to guide him all the way to the celestial city. God is complete in what he gives you and me, forgives you, robes you, guides you, and takes you to the celestial city. What a brilliant allegorical description, the angel of dawn, the angel of daybreak, and the angel of dusk to guide you, to give you the wisdom, to lead you into his eternal presence. Many of you may be familiar with this story, so pardon me, but it's, you know, when I sit on a plane sometimes, people next to me might think, is this guy okay? <laughs> because I keep memorizing things, and I keep repeating to myself things that I've memorized. So I'm not sure whether I do it while I'm sleeping or not, but oftentimes I do get some stares when I wake up. <laughs> and repetition is good for the soul. You've heard this story, I'm sure, many of you, but it brings a beautiful ending to what I want to say to you. It's about this rich man who had a great art gallery in his home and this good son 
the son would walk through town and he would always stop by a beggar's little place where he sat on the sidewalk begging. And this wealthy son would engage the beggar in conversation and we talk about his father's art gallery. And the beggar said, you know, I can draw too. So he said, next time bring me some paper and I'll draw you something. And so after the boy brought it, young man brought it, he did a portrait of the young man and next time he came he gave it to him and said, this is my portrait of you. Well, it didn't do very much, but he was quite happy to take it. Years went by and he found out that the rich man had passed away, but the son had come and told him that. Some more time went by and the son stopped coming. So one day he picked up his little sheet from the sidewalk and picked up his little container and walked towards the gate of the home and he said, what happened? I used to be a young man here, always came to see me. He said, oh, well, he, he passed away too. He said, oh, wow, I didn't know that. So the man, watchman told him, you know, you're, you're really disturbing there because they're going to have a gallery, uh, an auction of his art gallery and so on. So the beggar rushes home, puts on some nice clothes and comes back and he slips in. He wants to get in to see this art gallery. And he wants to see whether the young boy ever did anything with his etching and that he'd done. And he walks into the room with all these great paintings and he sees his own etching on the wall. He said, oh, wow. The man doing the auction starts the bidding and everybody is getting restless. And they say, let's get on, please, in a hurry. So he pounds the gavel and he says this. He said, before we get on with all these paintings, the man left in his will one proviso, that this portrait of the sun is to be auctioned first. Nobody bid on it. The beggar put his hand into his pocket, took out the coins, and he says, I bid on that. So they took this off the wall and gave it to this beggar. Somebody says, can we get on with the real stuff now? And the cavalier says, no. The man made a second proviso in his will. Whoever gets the sun gets the entire collection. Have you got the sun? Apostle Paul says, we are complete in him. We are complete in him. And I present to you today, the world out there is caught in this vortex of relativism, the absoluteness of God's word and the supremacy of love will carry you through. We will never change the outside until we have changed within. Let the word of God be found again in our places of worship, in our churches, any place that claims to know him. Let the word of God be central and let worship be the consummate expression of all that you and I really are. The word and worship. Once we do that, the world will see the beauty that is Christ's and want to follow him. Will you pray with me? How beautiful, how beautiful the sight of thee must be. Thy endless wisdom, boundless love, and awesome purity. Prostrate before thy throne to lie and gaze and gaze on thee. Lord Jesus, forgive us if we repeat your sacred name a thousand times a day. Lord, our hearts ache with all that we see wrong going on. And yet you've called us first to search our own hearts on all that is wrong within. I pray for all those listening online, maybe a businessman, maybe a politician, maybe a young person. Where they are, may that head be bowed in surrender to you. 
Lord, I think of my own life. and marvel that with all of the fragility and weakness and insufficiency in your grace you have given me the privilege of standing here tonight, a privilege accorded very, very few, and yet you have given it to your servant through the kindness of people. I bring my own heart back to you, Lord. I need you. I love you. I want to surrender to you afresh. In this whole audience tonight, let every heart come to you, Lord Jesus. For you alone are the bread of life. You give the water of life. You are the savior, the sanctifier, the healer, the coming king. Move in your power, especially to anyone resisting you. Break down the barrier, gain victory. And then, Lord Jesus, we pray for our nation. We need you. So much rancor, so much argument, so much hate, so much vengeance, so much rivalry. Oh, Lord. We are like children skipping through the corridors of a kingdom, looking at everything, pausing to learn the true value of nothing. Mend this nation. And we pray the same for our world. In the neediest parts, may your grace be strongest. And now as my brother Fernando ministers in music, minister to our hearts again. And my heartfelt thanks for tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.